Louise Michel, Voltairine de Clare, Emma Goldman, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, Buenaventura de Ruti, Ricardo Flores Magon. The big names of anarchism wrote, spread, and sowed libertarian thought. The great migratory waves, which had already carried it to the United States of America, also took it to the most remote countries of the earth, be it in Palestine or Egypt, amongst Jewish exiles or Indian communities, within the confines of the African continent as in the East, and as far as the empire of the rising sun, anarchists were everywhere. At the beginning of the 20th century, all seemed to be for the best and the best of all possible libertarian worlds. Anarchism had become a part of the social landscape, to the point that libertarians could be seen flying their black flag on the brand new postcards. And if they were arrested, it was only disguised as nursemaids for the comic purposes of a Pathé Brothers production. The ultimate irony came in 1910, when Armand Fallière, the new president of the French Republic, even went in person to Besançon to inaugurate, in a lavish ceremony complete with the Marseillais and marching Swiss guards, a monumental statue dedicated to the father of anarchism, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. But in the wings, conditions for workers remained very difficult. And faced with an imminent global crisis, the need for great change was making itself felt more than ever. And this is how, from France to Mexico and from Spain to the Ukraine, in a time full of sound and fury, anarchists set about trying to destroy the old world once and for all. However, it wasn't with a revolution that the libertarian 20th century began. Neither was it in 1907 in Amsterdam during this international congress where the cream of world anarchism managed to more or less come to agreement on the necessity of organizing the movement into national federations, capable of setting off a general strike and revolt should war be declared. The libertarian 20th century began spontaneously much earlier on, at a particular time in a forgotten place, with this new kind of woman and man creating one of the other great currents of the anarchist movement, individualism. Descendants of the Age of Enlightenment and heirs to Romanticism, individualists were the enfants terribles of their time. They read Nietzsche and Stirner, advocated mass conscientious objection, and insisted on immediately leading a full life at odds with the authoritarian principles of society at the time. I have examined the trajectories of these people one by one. And what they wanted was to be able to work with their hands, but also with their heads, to be whole men. They wanted to lead what they considered to be the good life, which was far from being an easy life. And they wanted to lead it here and now. This global desire for change, which led individualists to reject work, family, country, the very foundations of bourgeois morality, brought them to propose an alternative lifestyle and new practices of their own invention, which in turn made revolutionaries of them. It was to include absolutely all aspects of life, sexuality, education, clothing. They advocated nudity. Women abandoned the concept of corsets, hats, and restrictive clothing. In place of marriage, they advocated open unions, or in some cases, free love. Multiple relationships were possible. There was no problem in loving several people at once, neither for women nor for men. At least that was the doctrine, but in reality, of course, there was much grinding of teeth and suffering. Being individualists did not prevent these anarchists from grouping together. And if they couldn't change the world, then they decided to change the universe. In towns, they created libertarian Athenians, and in the country, agricultural colonies. And wherever they went, they developed coherence in their ideas and actions, like here in Palestine, where Jewish anarchists founded Degania, the first kibbutz. But it was particularly in Latin America that truly libertarian cities grew up. There was New Australia and Paraguay, where amongst others, Mary Gilmore settled. And the Colonia Sicilia, founded in Brazil by Giovanni Rossi and a group of Italian anarchists, of which only one image remains. For four years, these libertarians abolished hierarchies, religion, and money, set up councils, loved freely, 
and sang songs. But anarchism didn't triumph, and these colonies, truly alternative societies, which were meant to be the seeds of a new world, closed one after another. Certain individualists concluded that in order to change society, you had to change the individual. And to change the individual, evil had to be pulled up at the roots. In their opinion, middle-class schooling instilled authoritarian values in children from the outset and consolidated all the mechanisms of power. It needed to be attacked and revolutionized. They became constructive educationists, devising teaching methods which combined ancient paideia with libertarian principles. The task of the anarchist was to educate. In a way, you could say, they needed to create the new man before they could create the new society. Great emphasis was placed upon intellectual, sensorial, and even physical elevation. No aspect of life was ignored. Experiments into new forms of education sprung up all around the world, such as Sebastian Faure's La Ruche, and Paul Robin's Sans Puy Orphanage. But one of the most comprehensive was the modern school founded in Spain and based on the anti-authoritarian principles of Francisco Ferrer. Francisco Ferrer was an important uh, anarchist pedagogue who started something called the modern school movement. And the idea was to bring secular, non-religious education to children, but also to adults tried to create an equal relationship between the teachers and the students, where the students could choose what they wanted to learn. It was integral education. That is to say, it had to be both manual and intellectual. The child needed to know how to do just about anything. It was exclusively based on the use of reason, without imposing anything upon the child from outside. We are not afraid to say it. We want to create men whose intellectual independence will be their supreme force, who will submit before nothing, capable of discerning what is good and aspiring to live 1,000 lives in the space of just one. Society fears such men, and we must not expect it ever to support education which is capable of producing them. The fascinating thing when you read about the anarchist view of education, and in my opinion this is something rare amongst educational theorists, is that they are suspicious of themselves. They are so wary about illegitimate authority that their reflections about education contain a deep analysis of the dangers of indoctrination within their own projects. So you can read things along the lines, never forget that we're not looking to produce good little anarchists. Let us always be wary of the power which we ourselves have over these children. We are trying to make free men. They may think differently from us later on. That is how we will know that we have indeed made free men. These secular and libertarian schools where children can be seen wearing hoods naturally stirred up fantasies. And their success was as worrying for the clergy as it was for the bourgeoisie. Francisco Ferrer, their founder, despite always having been opposed to any form of violence, had to be arrested as quickly as possible. During the tragic week in Barcelona, an opportunity was found to wrongfully charge him. He quickly became a target of repression. In 1909, he was accused of having instigated the Barcelona general strike and was condemned to death. International solidarity quickly developed on all the continents, in the United States, in Australia, in all the major cities of Europe. There were demonstrations for a stay of execution. There were petitions. There were even governments who intervened, asking the Spanish government to spare him. But Ferrer was executed. And then a few hours after his execution, crowds started to gather in big cities everywhere, but particularly in Paris. The Parisian rampage was to be the most spectacular of all. 
On the 13th of October 1909, there was an uprising of extraordinary intensity. Road workers, who were at that time the cornerstone of the proletariat, arrived with pickaxes over their shoulders and tore up the avenues, exposed gas pipes, pierced them and set them alight. Paris became an inferno. The assassination of Ferrer at the hands of Spanish justice, which provoked the most violent uprising in Paris since the Commune, had similar repercussions throughout the world. There were the demonstrations in Kotoku in Japan a few months later, and those of Sacco and Vanzetti in the USA, which all sparked immense international solidarity movements. Faced with this state violence against innocent humanists, numerous libertarians took up arms and attacked what society held most dearly. Exponents of theft, which they preferred to call expropriation, individual reclamation or revolutionary banditry attempted to set off in Europe a revolution which seemed too long in the making. Anarchists everywhere struck out at property and burglary suddenly became a revolutionary strategy. The problem is very simple. If I'm a revolutionary opposed to capitalism, for what mysterious reason would I not attack a bank? Why would I not expropriate a bank to finance the revolution? Method is another question. I'm not talking about killing the little old lady waiting at the teller's window. I'm talking about a radical assault on capitalism in the form of a bank robbery. In the eyes of a revolutionary, there's nothing scandalous about it. As a little aside, even Stalin did it. Indeed, that's what all revolutionaries do. But it was anarchists who turned these tactics into a system and associated their names with the biggest robberies of the time. There was Buenaventura Duruti, Spain's leading terrorist before becoming the leader of the anarchist revolution in Catalonia, who, along with the Solidarios, plundered parts of Europe and Latin America. There was Severino Di Giovanni, Argentina's public enemy number one, who pulled off the biggest robbery his country had seen to date. In the Ukraine, Nestor Makhno, at the heart of the Union of Poor Workers, expropriated and redistributed the confiscated goods. But in France, it was Marius Jacob, striving at the heart of the band of night workers, who made the greatest impression. He was very well organized and very gifted in this domain. Marius Jacob robbed businesses, churches of course, rich individuals, but as far as possible without employing the least violence, and even with a certain elegance. He would sometimes leave little ironic notes for the people he'd robbed. Yes? I have stolen a pocket handkerchief from you worth 250 francs. Is a 250 franc handkerchief not an insult to misery? Marius Jacob, the anarchist thief, who despite committing more than 500 robberies only kept for himself enough to live on, served as Maurice Leblanc's model in the creation of the character Arsène Lupin. But the state, wanting to send a message to anarchists tempted by illegality, arrested him and despite his eloquence, inflicted an exemplary punishment. This man, who had never shed blood, was condemned to the bloodless guillotine of a lifetime's hard labor and deported to French Guiana. For revolutionary bandits, the message was clear. Since authority sends even the innocents to their deaths, better to kill before being killed. It was in London in 1911 that the first major confrontation between revolutionary bandits and the forces of law and order would be played out. Over several hours, during what the history of anarchy would remember as the Battle of Stepney, a siege took place at 100 Sydney Street. At dawn, the neighborhood was completely closed off. Two anarchists holed up in a small house offered fierce resistance to more than 800 police officers and members of the Scots Guards. The operations were overseen by the Home Secretary, a certain Winston Churchill, who could be seen on the left in a top hat. Unable to dislodge them, the artillery was sent for. The house caught fire, and the two revolutionaries died in the flames. Newsreel cameras were sent to the scene where a considerable crowd had gathered to watch the show. But was this young mechanic, who legend has it was Conan Doyle's London chauffeur, among the curious bystanders? One thing is sure. On his return to France the following year, he decided to move into action by forming a gang which would soon send a shockwave across Europe, the Bono Gang. I prefer to call them the tragic bandits, 
Firstly, because this wasn't a gang under the authority of a leader. And if there was a leader, I see no reason why it would have been Bono rather than someone else. They were militant anarchists, devoutly militant individualists with a combative past. The young Octave Garnier, for example, had been imprisoned following a construction workers' strike during which he was severely beaten by the police and ended up finding what he had been looking for in individualism. Austere doctrinaires leading exemplary lives, these men were strangers to tobacco, alcohol, gambling or brothels. They frequented the anarchy newspaper directed by Victor Serge. But it was through their knowledge of mechanics that they first entered history by being the first to use a car to commit robberies. The meager takings were far from being sufficient to finance a revolution, but their attacks were characterized by indiscriminate violence. The number of dead they left behind soared. A price was put on their heads, with the press offering a reward of 100,000 francs to whoever enabled their capture. The brand new Tiger Brigades were set on their trail, but far from being afraid, the bandits defied society, with Octave Garnier going as far as riding to the heads of the 3rd Brigade, known as the Anarchist Brigade. I know this will come to an end. In the ongoing struggle between society's impressive arsenal and myself, I know that I will be beaten. I will be the weaker, but I hope to make you pay a high price for your victory. It ended up in a siege between isolated men and a thousand strong troop, with 10,000 spectators who had come to see the capture of these hunted men. They fought like lions to the very end, knowing full well that they had no chance of escape. I would say that's what actually turned them into propagandists by the deed. The tragic bandits' actions came to an end on the 28th of April, 1912, in the suburbs of Paris. Here, too, the newsreel cameras were invited to the show. The police placed bombs which were set off. When the operation was over, the bodies of the anarchists were put on display like hunting trophies. This affair left a lasting impression and momentarily marked the end of revolutionary banditry in France. Bonneau, like many illegalists, gradually became a controversial figure, rejected by or reintegrated into anarchist thinking in accordance with the needs of the time. Rather than consider the actions of the Bono gang as a genuine protest movement, personally, I tend more towards the theory that it was the manifestation of a failure. That is to say, these are events which sometimes attract a sort of morbid curiosity, but in reality they remain marginal occurrences. And as far as the Bono gang was concerned, it was the marginality of a group which was marginal. The media circus which had grown up around the Bono gang was above all instrumental in disqualifying the anarchist movement in its efforts to avoid war because in the face of mass demonstrations by libertarians, alongside other socialists, here, for example, at the Pré Saint-Gervais near Paris, or during the Red Week in Ancona in Italy, where Malatesta managed to spread the general strike to the marches, to Romagna, and as far as Tuscany, the imperialisms were above all worried that the workers of the world might come to an agreement. They had reinstigated the villainous laws and made up lists, like the infamous B file in France, which contained the names of all suspected revolutionary leaders to be arrested should a conflict begin. But thanks to the fear generated by the tragic bandit affair, and faced with the shock provoked by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, the state had no need to resort to these methods. And with the death of Jean Jaurès, even some anarchist mainstays like Kropotkin ended up rallying behind the sacred union. And while Europe was on the point of engaging in a war which would kill millions of workers, although it's not always remembered, anarchists in Mexico were behind the first great libertarian revolution. It's hard to understand why the Mexican revolution doesn't have the same importance attached to it as the Russian revolution or the Chinese revolution but it was the first major revolution of the 20th century.
the Mexican Revolution begins at the end of 1910. And in its early stages, 1910, 1911, 1912, one of the factions, the major factions fighting within the Mexican Revolution was the uh, Partido Liberal Mexicano, the PLM, which is led by the Magón brothers, Enrique and Ricardo Flores Magón, who are Mexican anarchists in exile in the United States uh, when the revolution breaks out. Flores Magón and his comrades played a fundamental role. As the precursors of this revolutionary movement, they created the conditions necessary for the revolution. You could say that they were a constant inspiration for all the other revolutionary factions. Their propaganda continuously pushed the other factions to be more radical. Magon, in fact, regarded the Mexican Revolution as the first act in the great worldwide conflagration which was just around the corner. For him, the global libertarian revolution was just about to take off. The Mexican Liberal Party, which was at the origin of the revolution, was liberal and a party in nothing but name. But it was well and truly an anarchist organization, as can be seen from its manifesto, written by Ricardo Flores Magón. Its place in the purest libertarian tradition was not only because it advocated direct action, but also, and above all, by virtue of its call for vast agrarian reform. For it has to be remembered that since its beginnings, the anarchist movement was the only form of socialism to assign a central role in the revolutionary process to farm workers. Furthermore, this explains its success in a Mexico which was still highly agricultural. And this concept spread. It inspired the three other mass revolutionary organizations. Emiliano Zapata's insurrectionary army in the south, the house of the world worker in the capital in the center, and the Mexican branch of the IWW, which had opened in the north. And the slogan which Flores Magan and the anarchists of the PLM placed at the bottom of their writings was taken up by these movements and became the rallying cry of the entire revolution, land and liberty. They said to the peasants, grab a Winchester in hand and take the land because it belongs to you. You didn't have to wait for the working class to uh, develop the peasants could have their own revolution. Magon had confidence in the spontaneity of an armed populace. That is to say that he considered an armed uprising, a fight to the death against the system to be the way of establishing a libertarian society. This call to arms resounded as strongly here as it did on the slopes of the Sierra Madre and the high ground of the Chiapas, where peasants had lived for 400 years in a state of extreme misery. Evangelization the encomienda and smallpox had done their work. The native peoples had been almost entirely wiped out. The womb of the Pachamama was desecrated daily and the whole subcontinent was bled dry, humiliated and corrupted. Placed under the control of a handful of latifundists who owned all the land, the vast majority of workers survived with no prospect of betterment. The day-to-day -day life of these men and women was illiteracy, famine and illness and back-breaking work beneath the blazing sun which burnt celluloid and skin alike. Shouts and blows were the only encouragement and confiscation the only reward. The slightest gesture of revolt was punished with the whip and any attempt to escape, as in the times of slavery, by death. In 1911, uh, the Magones organize an invasion of northern Mexico, of Baja, California. Uh, there's a group of around 50 Italian anarchists from the United States and Canada who crossed the border to join the PLM's forces. There's, uh, there are dozens of members of the IWW. There are African-American radicals who join. There's at least one Chinese partisan. They invade the city of Mexicali uh, in northern Mexico, seize it from federal troops, maintain control of it, and then they also seize Tijuana. And for a period of a few months, they control this area of northern Mexico. The small army of the MLP, surrounded by the IWW and led by General Mosby, seen here on horseback, opened the prisons and flew the black flag over the Land and Liberty Commune. The libertarians of the whole world expressed their enthusiasm. Emma Goldman took part in meetings Kropotkin wrote the first theory on guerrilla warfare. Jack London published a collection of short stories. 
in the United States, in Argentina, in Cuba, in Portugal, in Italy. The anarchist press everywhere enthused about the Mexican uprising, which would perhaps overturn the old order. In this time, when songs still spoke of the lives of men, Joe Hill, a Swedish expatriate and rebellious troubadour, who was a leading figure in the IWW, went to participate in the uprising in the same way as the international brigades would do later. Should I Ever Be a Soldier, the song which he wrote for the occasion, is a musical testimony to this involvement and a call to other workers to join the fight. It's to crush the tyrant's might. Join the army of the toilers. Men and women fall in line. Wage slates of the murderers do your duty for the cause for land and liberty. It's the first time that anarchists see a situation in which there is uh, in army, under anarchist leadership, taking steps to implement uh, libertarian communism. That's the express goal of the PLM, is to create a new anarchist society in Mexico, and then from there to spread the revolution to North America and to the rest of the world. Um, so anarchists, not, not just in the United States, but in Europe, uh, people like Peter uh, Kropotkin as well, view the, the Mexican Revolution in its early years as, a, as potentially an anarchist revolution in the making, and the very first one. But caught in a vice between Mexican counter-revolutionaries on one side and the Yankee army on the other, the fight was too weighted against them. The communes were retaken, the Mexican revolutionaries shot, and the captured foreigners were herded together in camps at the border. But although they had lost a battle in the north, the anarchists had not lost the war. And Flores Magón's hopes turned toward the south and a rugged and rebellious army led by a charismatic general. Right from the start, Ricardo Flores Magón considered that Zapata, even if he didn't regard himself as an anarchist, in practice he behaved like one as did the Zapatist troops. They commandeered land without waiting for any sort of legislation and distributed it amongst themselves. Emiliano Zapata, who represented the indigenous peoples, had been influenced by the reasoning of the Mexican Liberal Party. And the Flores Magón brothers, who knew him well, had an enormous sympathy with the Zapatist movement. The Zapatist army, which consisted of nearly 28,000 fighters at the height of the revolution, engaged in truly guerrilla warfare in the southern states. As they gradually advanced, they redistributed land, even minted their own money, and managed to reach the gates of Mexico City. Was the libertarian revolution on the point of triumph in Latin America? In their weariness, the jubilant crowds who watched the revolutionary troops going by were unaware that Mexico would become the theater of a terrible misunderstanding. A misunderstanding between anarchists of the towns and anarchists of the fields, between workers and peasants, which was to weigh heavily on the history of the libertarian movement. Because the Mexican capital was under the control of the House of the World Worker, the mighty urban anarcho-syndicalist organization, which was purportedly 50,000 men strong. The workers of Mexico City and the towns tended to consider the peasant masses as reactionaries. They were of the opinion that the new world couldn't be a product of the backward peasant masses as they saw them, but rather the avant-garde enlightened workers. The Zapatas turned up with their rosary beads and their Virgin of Guadalupe medallions. The reaction of the Mexico City anarchists was to say they were under the influence of Catholicism. They said to themselves, they've been manipulated instead of genuinely questioning what they were doing. What did these peasants do? They didn't go to mass. They went with their arms to take land. In practice, they reacted like truly militant anarchists. While the militant anarchists of the cities, who were more intellectual, regarded them as the Marxist cliché of capitalist lackeys or lackeys of the church. It was really a wasted opportunity between anarcho-syndicalism and Zapatism. 
et le zapatisme. You had this terrible break uh, in uh, 1916 between where the leadership of the, the COM decided to, to form red battalions to attack the Zapatistas. This was clearly a class betrayal. Having completely lost their bearings, the workers of the red battalions turned into auxiliaries of the bourgeois army. And thanks to them, the counter-revolutionaries brought down blind repression on the population. In Tlalzitapan, where the Zapatists had set up their staff headquarters, 268 peasants were massacred, including 112 women and 42 children. By way of a swan song, Ricardo Flores Magón published a manifesto for anarchists of the world and workers in general. But the only ones to hear him were the North American authorities, who arrested him and condemned him to end his days in a high-security prison. And Zapata himself ended up being caught in an ambush. This internal war between uh, different progressive factions uh, is really what helped throttle the anarchist content of the revolution at the at what what should have should have been its peak. Unfortunately, in the end, no real reflection went into analyzing the causes of the anarchists' failure during the Mexican Revolution. Consequently, soon afterwards, the Liberal Party and Flores Magón were forgotten about. As things turned out, the Mexican anarchists had no time to feel sorry for themselves to learn any lessons from what had happened. But if the Mexican Revolution was forgotten, it was because European libertarians were caught up in the worst days of the First World War. And their lack of interest in the results of this far-off uprising was deepened when, in 1917, at the gates of Europe, a revolutionary breeze was felt blowing from Russia. Suddenly, something new in the East. In February 1917, there was the first Russian Revolution. The Tsar made a run for it. A certain democracy was set up with the Soviets, the workers' councils, taking over. The anarchists found that wonderful. An eight-hour day, the abolition of the death penalty, freedom of opinion and of conscience. Initially, the Russian Revolution attacked injustice and gave all power to the Soviets. In this immense Russia where homage was paid to Tolstoy, where a monument was built to the glory of Bakunin, and Kropotkin was given ministries, anarchists could be forgiven for thinking that anarchy was at last in the process of triumphing. The beginning of the Russian Revolution helped reinvigorate the anarchist movement because it was the kind of revolution, it seemed, that they advocated a spontaneous Insurrection. The vast majority saw it as an extremely positive thing that somewhere in the world, it so happened to be in Russia, men and women had risen up to say that the former system of power was over. Initially, the anarchists believed that there was a possibility that in Russia they would at least see the birth of a truly communist country. I nearly said state, but they didn't want a state. They wanted a country which would turn itself into a communist society. Partisans of libertarian communism. Forgotten was the battle between Marx and Bakunin at the heart of the First International. They could now see in the Bolshevik revolutionaries, with whom despite disagreements about methodology, it would be possible to team up and create the new world together. Anarchists in Russia have been active partners with the Bolsheviks and with the socialist revolutionaries and others in helping to overthrow the Tsar, uh, in, in organizing Soviets and factory committees. The enthusiasm of libertarian Russians can also be explained by the fact that Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, alias Lenin, was not at the time considered to be a dogmatic Marxist or an inspiring despot. His party did not yet call itself communist. The first political treaty written by him was entitled, What is to be done? in reference to the novel by the libertarian Russian Chernyshevsky. He was opposed to the sacred union and had demonstrated an anti-militarism which had seduced the libertarian masses. 
But above all, for Russian anarchists, Lenin was still the little brother of Alexander Ulyanov, a propagandist by the deed, hanged in 1887 for having prepared an assassination attempt against the Tsar. This glorious genealogy, added to his libertarian pledges, led them to believe that Lenin might be sympathetic toward them, and the publication in 1917 of his book, The State and Revolution, seemed to confirm this hypothesis. You have to realize that at one point, Lenin started expressing radical ideas pretty far removed from orthodox Marxism. He also vehemently criticized the idea of the state, thereby holding out a hand to anarchists. We do not, after all, differ with the anarchists on the question of the abolition of the state as the aim. We maintain that to achieve this aim, we must temporarily make use of the instruments, resources, and methods of state power against the exploiters. We set ourselves the ultimate aim of a abolishing the state. And what's more, Lenin stands his ground saying we're going to be accused of being anarchists for saying that. But all the same, I'd rather be accused of being an anarchist now than being confused with social democrats who form part of the governments of the sacred union. So that helped to bolster the illusion on both sides that Bolsheviks and anarchists actually had the same objective in mind, had more or less the same methodology in the field, and were only separated in terms of internal organization. This illusion of a convergence of points of view and a similarity in the objectives was once more accentuated in October when Lenin put into action a strategy directly inspired from anarchists, the storming of the Winter Palace. For the anarchists who took part, their moment of glory had arrived. Clearly that provoked an incredible amount of hope. Even Malatesta at the beginning looked kindly upon the Russian Revolution, at the beginning. And even Kropotnik went back to Russia because he thought that the revolution was going to veer towards libertarianism. And along with Emma Goldman, from the four corners of the earth, anarchists flocked to take part in the revolution. Libertarian organizations quickly claimed the high ground, like in Moscow, where the Federation of Anarchist Groups controlled part of the city. But it was in the Ukraine that the libertarian movement showed its potential, thanks to a young peasant of Zaporozhian Cossack origins, who, in taking the leadership of the uprising in northern Crimea, became one of the major figures of 20th century anarchism. Makhno was a peasant of very humble extraction, but with immense military talent. And he managed to organize a peasant and popular uprising in the Ukraine. He created anarchist-type communities pretty much everywhere. And proved that a revolutionary avant-garde did not necessarily need to take the form of a party. During the months after leaving Huliapule in the fertile plains of the Ukraine, the Makhnovshina, the insurrectionary army which bore the name of its organizer, sowed revolution as it passed. An anarchist and peasant militia, it flew a black flag with a skull and crossbones under which was written, death to all those who oppose workers' freedom. And as it gradually advanced, the Makhnovshina, like the legions of Spartacus of old, took over the towns and day after day expanded its influence. At its height, the Makhnovshina controlled a territory equal in size to that of an average European country, in which hundreds of thousands of people lived. When they seized a, a city, they, the first thing they did was open the jail and release all the prisoners. Um, they distributed, uh, they redistributed uh, food and whatnot amongst themselves and the, the population. Uh, they drew up plans for uh, collective ownership of uh, farms and factories. Makhno's army functioned on a voluntary basis. Officers were elected. The peasant communities, which found it necessary to defend their land and liberty with weapons, sent volunteers to join the army. They freely supplied horses, chariots and food. Uh, 
They formed an army of up to 40,000 men, with all that that entails, administration services, medical teams. At one point, they even had an armored train. An armored train like Trotsky's, except that theirs had anarchy written on it. It allowed Batko Makno, Father Makno, as his supporters called him, and these are the only filmed images of him, to transport his cavalry from Huliapoli and Alexandrovsk, Kharkov, and even as far as Kiev, the whole length of a front which stretched over 1,000 kilometers. In this way, his troops could carry out a veritable war of harassment on the planks of Petliura's counter-revolutionary forces. And behind the terrible white armies of General Denikin, and in the month of October 1919, the second anniversary of the uprising, at a moment when everything seemed lost for the Bolsheviks, Makhno and the anarchists saved the Russian Revolution. The population in the Bolsheviks had begun to take flight. Here's a really good example of the efficiency of the Makhvovshina, which didn't just sit around in its own backyard. Makhno was capable of thinking of the common interest, thereby saving the revolution. That particular moment at the beginning of 1919 was his hour of glory, when he organized an alliance with the Red Army, an alliance which was voluntary on both sides and which was immortalized in front of the cameras. There's the Bolshevik, Dibenko, with his impressive stature, and Makhno looking so small beside him. It's a bit like looking at two conceptions of the same revolution, the hardline Bolshevik one, and then Makhno, who has the air of a somewhat romantic revolutionary leader about him. But in Moscow, where Lenin had just decreed war communism, the anarchists' actions had started to be frowned upon, as had the criticisms which they were already voicing at the very heart of the new capital concerning dictatorship over the proletariat. For most other anarchists, that is the signal that the Bolsheviks are not true revolutionaries, that they are not interested in uh, the well-being of the working masses, that they are not friends of of the anarchists or anyone else who is not a Bolshevik. This was essentially a moment when the Bolsheviks, who were basically a revolutionary group amongst others, found themselves politically isolated in attempting to stabilize their power, notably by trying to eliminate those who had the same sort of militarized groups as themselves. So it was a question of who was going to win. In the face of criticism, Trotsky, who had just taken over leadership of the Red Army, decided to, as he put it, rid Russia of anarchism with an iron broom. But he first had to invent consent. Aware of the potential of a new weapon of mass propaganda, the Bolsheviks went about producing, for the fledgling cinema, films denouncing the dangers of middle-class disorganization and of anarcho-banditry. <laughs> The Bolsheviks did not attempt any revolution in their methods of communication. They simply recycled the same worn-out clichés used by the bourgeois European press, which had portrayed libertarians as inebriated, provocative arsonists to be crushed. This brought about a genuine rupture between anarchists and the Bolsheviks who were very quickly to become the most dangerous adversaries that the anarchist movement had ever had. But when Kropotkin died in 1921, the authorities suddenly decided to organize a national funeral. Were the Bolsheviks feeling remorse? All the country's cameras were mobilized to capture this homage paid by the revolution to one of the fathers of anarchism. Emma Goldman, who can be seen here, even delivered a eulogy at the service. When Kropotkin died in 1921, many anarchists were already in prison. The Bolshevik party allowed them to be released so that they could attend the funeral. There were thousands of them, but immediately afterwards, they were sent back to prison. These measures were extremely cynical. The Bolshevik regime manufactured a disconcerting lie. 
On the one side, they were celebrating someone who was by any standards a great Russian, and on the other, they were taking measures against his philosophy. The ceremony was hardly over when, under the direct orders of Lenin, the libertarian poet Lev Czerny and the militant Fanny Barron were shot dead in the cellars of the Cheka prison along with seven other anarchists. And in the following weeks, the Bolsheviks decided to purge the last two strongholds of anarchism in the Soviet Union. The Ukraine would be later, but first it was Kronstadt, where the sailors, formerly known as Glory and Honor of the Revolution, had formed a commune. For the Central Committee, the threat was too close and the symbol too dangerous. Despite Emma Goldman's offer to mediate, Trotsky sent in the Red Army, which crushed the small island under its bombs. The end of the suppression of the Kronstadt uprising was on March 18, 1921, which corresponded both with the Bolshevik Party Congress and the anniversary of the Paris Commune. So from a symbolic point of view, it was very impressive. In the spring of 1921, only the Makhnovshina were left to oppose the Bolsheviks. It was on the shores of the Black Sea, amid alcohol fumes and Cossack dancing, that the anarchist army, apparently unaware of the famous phrase inspired by the Aeneid, Timio Bolshevico et Dona Ferentes, beware of Bolsheviks bearing gifts, was decimated by the Red Army. The cavalry and the Makhnovshina officers were with the Red Army near to Sebastopol. They threw a huge banquet to celebrate a victory. As you know, Leninism was very well organized. And during the night, all the Makhnovist officers were shot dead. The final pages of the Makhno saga are tragic. It's a desperate race, a battle with no hope of victory, the struggle of a wounded beast. The Russian Revolution was catastrophic for anarchism. The anarchist movement totally ceased to exist in Russia. Its last representatives died in Stalin's camps or in exile. But the executions and the deportation of anarchists to the Solovki Islands had the principal objective of reducing libertarians to silence. Because at the very moment when it was attempting to make the workers' world believe that socialism was being built within its borders, the Bolshevik authorities could not take the risk that testimony from frontline revolutionaries might tear aside the veil of the workers' illusions. That's why the assassinations were accompanied by the total censure of anarchists' words. And since that day, and even more so after the rise to power of Stalin, for whom, as we know from his early writings, anarchism was a long-term preoccupation, the Marxist history books have made no mention of the role played by libertarians in the Russian Revolution. It has taken many years for the new generations in the East, as well as a large part of the West, to be able to hear the total criticism of the Soviet regime, which was first formulated by anarchists. The anarchists were the first to raise this critique of the fact that this would in fact be state capitalism, that the state would become the sole landlord, the state would become the sole capitalist, and this would not in fact change capitalist relations with the working class at all, other than, that, than the fact that the working class really would then have nowhere to hide. If they had no place to hide, it was because during the immediate aftermath of the war, the capitalist bourgeoisie also tried to repress the anarchists' revolutionary attempts wherever they could, with no lesser barbarity than the Bolsheviks had done. Like in Germany, where the libertarian leaders of the Bavarian Soviet Republic, Erich Musam, Ernst Toller, Rett Marut, were imprisoned, hunted down, or lynched by a mob like Gustav Landauer, whose body was left by the authorities to rot in the street for several days by way of an example. In Bulgaria, the uprising of the 23rd of September, 1923, which was intended to establish a government of workers and peasants, ended up in a white terror, during which the very orthodox King Boris III purportedly had the head of Georges Chetanov, the young Bulgarian anarchism theorist, delivered to him on a tray. 
The tragic week which brought to an end the hopes raised by the great demonstrations in La Fora in Argentina found an echo in Colombia with the Banana Massacre, when the United Fruit Company assassinated hundreds of anarcho-syndicalists. These repressive waves flowed as far as China, where the movement of May 4, 1999, inspired by Liu Shifu, the first Chinese anarchist, was broken up by the warlords. A young teacher present in Tiananmen Square in Peking, a certain Mao Zedong, witnessed the brutal repression of students and was deeply marked by it. This terror of anarchism sent a tremor as far as the slopes of Mount Fuji, where the Imperial Japanese authorities arrested and beat to death Sakai Usugi and Ito Noe, as well as their six-year-old nephew, whose unrecognizable bodies were thrown to the bottom of a well. Let's not forget Italy, which came to the brink of revolution. Capitalism also re-established its order here, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Malatesta, who can be seen here on the left, haranguing the crowd. The bourgeoisie will make the proletariat pay for its attempts at revolution with tears of blood. Yes, wherever anarchism has tried to make its ideas triumph, its militants have been arrested, persecuted, and assassinated. Even in the United States of America, another historic land of anarchism, the revolutionary movement was fought against. And this fight would culminate in the condemning to death of two innocents. Car notre sang bleu est noir, notre drapeau rouge est noir, notre étoile jaune est noire, notre vie en rose est noire, oui notre sang bleu est noir, notre drapeau rouge est noir, notre étoile jaune est noire, notre vie en rose est Sure.